Chapter 1, The World Before the Opening of the Atlantic. Section 4, Europe Before Transatlantic Travel. Section 4 is going to be kind of an overview, really, of your 6th grade social studies year. And the reason why we're going to talk about some of the things that we talked about last year is because the things we talked about in the section were influential to our founding fathers when it came time to create a government for our United States. So we're going to start by talking about the ancient cultures of Greece and Rome and how they influenced the United States. The Greeks are going to establish the first democracy, a form of government in which people rule themselves. Citizens vote on every issue, and ideas are debated at an assembly of citizens. Now, here's a little quiz for you. Who, or what city-state, created the first democracy? Athens is the correct answer. In Rome, the Romans established something called a republic which is where citizens elect representatives to vote on issues and are debated in an assembly of representatives. So you're voting for someone to serve you in the government. Laws, which protect a citizen's rights, were written and kept on public display. Moving into the Middle Ages, we talked about a political system called feudalism. Basically, that was a system of agreements between lords and vassals. Lords having the most power, vassals were right beneath them. They were kind of lesser lords or lesser nobles. Uh, A lot of the vassals were knights. The lord promised to give land to his knights in exchange for military service. So the knights were there to protect uh, the uh, manner in which they lived. Also, the Catholic Church served as a strong, unifying force between kingdoms during this time period. The Catholic Church was very powerful. If you remember the Middle Ages, people weren't too interested in learning new things, and they were afraid that they would lose their lives. So they really looked for people to help protect them. So the lords were part of that system, and the Catholic Church was also part of that system as well. Two events are going to see the end of the Middle Ages. The first one would be the Crusades. And under the Crusades, remember, that was the attempt to free the holy city of Jerusalem from Muslim control. And there were numerous Crusades that were sent out there to free Jerusalem. Most of them were unsuccessful. Anyway, people started to feel a little more safer, if you will, traveling to the Middle East. And so because of that, more and more people started getting more courage to go out and start trading. And trade routes started to spring up again. An example of this would be the Silk Road. The Silk Road was a trade route that stretched from China all the way into Europe. You can kind of see on this map as I spread it out here. The trade routes as they grow through all of Asia. Sorry, I don't have my little pointer. These are all the different trade routes of the Silk Road. Going this way, they actually stretch over into here, going into Europe. Okay, shrink this back down. Now, trade brought not only goods to Europe, but it also, unfortunately, brought diseases. Diseases that were spread by rats. And on these rats were fleas who had carried a disease. And this disease spread throughout Europe, killing over 25 million people. This disease was called the bubonic plague, otherwise known as the Black Death. Because so many people died in Europe, as well as a war that was going on in Europe at the time too, the Hundred Years' War, there was a shortage in workers. And this meant that the peasants and serfs that were on the manors, who only worked for the lord of that manor, would start to leave those manors to go find jobs in the city because they could demand higher wages, higher payment. And so... Cities which had shrunk and some cities disappeared during the Middle Ages, they will start to grow again at the end of the Middle Ages. We'll next talk about the Renaissance period. Renaissance means rebirth, and this brought new ways of thinking to Europe. One new way of thinking was something called humanism, 
which shifted the focus from religion, which was predominant during the Middle Ages, to the importance of people and of human value. Now that humanistic uh, point of view will be seen in much of the artwork of the Renaissance period. And we'll talk about uh, two main artists, uh, as well as an inventor. These are just examples of the people who lived during the Renaissance period. The first one is Michelangelo. That's him right here. Michelangelo was famous for painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The Sistine Chapel is a chapel associated with St. Peter's Cathedral in Vatican. And if you can look at the picture carefully, if we were to blow that up, let's see if we can do that. Blow it up a little bit. Nah, it's not going to work too well. Anyway, it's basically a picture of the creation story in the Bible. So when I say humanism kind of goes away from religion, it doesn't mean that they didn't stop painting about religious topics. It just means that they show more human qualities and human value in those paintings. If you really look closely at this picture of the Sistine Chapel, it's kind of going back to the ancient Greek way of painting where they showed all these little intricate details. Uh, the, the people looked um, like real people. You saw muscle tone and little details like curls and hair and such. It's kind of going back, if you will, the rebirth of Greek work. Okay, over here you have Leonardo da Vinci. He's known as the Renaissance Man. That's because he was good at everything. He was a painter, a sculptor, an inventor, an astronomer. Um, he did all those things. This is actually a self-portrait of him. He painted that himself. And his probably his most famous work of art is the Mona Lisa. He also did the um, Last Supper as well. Again, intricate details, especially Mona Lisa. Some of her funny little features is she's kind of looking off to the side, but her head is facing that way. And she got this goofy little smirk on her face. She was just an ordinary person. Down here you have an inventor, Johannes Gutenberg. He's German. He invented the printing press, which allowed thousands of people to read and share ideas. The most popular book that was printed on the printing press back in these times was the Bible. And again, it allowed people to all have a book. They didn't have to share one. They were able to read and share ideas. The Bible was important because usually before the printing press, there was one Bible and that was in the church. Now people can actually own a Bible and read it. Lastly, we'll talk about an economic system called mercantilism, which unified and increased the power and wealth of a nation. Essentially what mercantilism does is a country can control trade with other countries. Italy was really good at mercantilism. They developed powerful trading cities that served as manufacturing centers. Now, I'm not sure why sports is there, so we'll just like cross that out. I don't know what the heck that was all about. But anyway, uh, there were key manufacturing cities and trade cities. Venice, for an example, was one of the biggest trade centers in Italy. Also, banks will emerge as powerful companies, and they kept money for merchants from all over Europe. Uh, very famous families who owned banks. One of the most famous families in, in Italy was the Medici family. They're based out of Florence. Merchants began to create joint stock companies, which were a group of people who invest together in order to reduce individual risk. And the reason why we're bringing this up, the joint stock companies, is that when we start talking about the 13 colonies, many of these colonies were formed using jo joint stock companies, various groups of people who chip in to own some land over in North America. That's the end of Section 4.